We noticed last time that last Wednesday evening that uh, the interesting things about Paul and Luke's recording of this thing. So he talks about how he survived to be able to be there before Agrippa. It could be, well, my nephew listened to something. The centurions were pretty nice to me. But he says, by the help of God, they just covered it. And God's providence dealt with each of those situations where they all were involved in saving him and warning him or the nephew of what was about to happen that allows him to be there at this particular uh, time. So verse 21, for this cause, that because of the gospel, the Jews seized me in the temple and, 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 and kind of said that they're going to kill me. And that's uh, the, what they wanted to do. And there's going to be an oath taken to try to do that. Verse 22, how he says, having therefore obtained the help that is from God, I stand on this day testifying to both small and great things that we're about to get ready to talk about. Uh, God works his will, not necessarily all the time in, with, with miracles. People say, well, if God acts today, it's a miracle. <laughs> no, there, there's something called, uh, we call it providence, providing a, a beforehand. And a lot of times that's the answer to our prayer. And that's the, what we say. Now, God intervened and talked directly to Paul. <laughs> uh, in a sense, I'm, you're going to be my witness in Rome. So he knew he's going to get there. Yes, he's going to have a shipwreck. And he thinks he's going to die. And, uh, but there's a sense of God's overriding providential preparing ahead of what he wants to accomplish according to his will. That's why we pray according to God's will. That's fine with us. Uh, that's the... Uh, we want his will, want him to be glorified, and whatever path that takes, we're going to submit to that and be thankful. Always in thanksgiving in our prayers when we are asking God for our help. But we can pray to God, not demanding a miracle. God, do a miracle for me right now. I have, uh, I've just lost, I've gone to the hint. Well, he can do things without a miracle. Maybe get you an open door to see that doctor instead of this doctor, this medicine instead of that medicine, to help you get a second opinion when you thought you're not going to get one, that type of thing. We can pray and realize that God can work those things out, and that's the power of prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. That didn't go on your table because of a miracle, but God is there providing. He made the, he made the grain grow. He, he's, he sets things that allows us to have it at our at needed time. And he, uh, he's always on time. It's always according to him and his will. So God had helped him survive. And I just want to just pay attention. that He gave him the credit uh, because he was involved in all those situations where he used people, a Roman soldier, a nephew, uh, to accomplish things. And a, and a worthy uh, chief captain who wants to make sure he has a reason for sending him to Caesar. That's what we're about to, to get to. So... We start this morning with question number 10. How does Paul use Moses and the prophets in his message? And, and let's just begin. Why would we say Moses and the prophets? What are we covering there? Uh, we see read elsewhere in the, in, the test, in the New Testament that says uh, Moses would be the what? The law. The law. Decalogue. Genesis. Actually, the biggest number. Deuteronomy. And... He was involved in writing that, the law of Moses. So there's the law and the prophets, the writings of the prophets. And a lot of those, indeed, we say, well, now we're getting into prophecy. Moses spoke of Jesus Christ. In other passages, we see that. That indeed there would be a prophet like unto Moses that would come among them. And he was pointing, of course, to Jesus, Jesus Christ. So let's notice again what he's emphasizing here in this message. When he says, I, I, I'm testifying, verse 22, both to small and great, everyone that's going to hear my voice. I don't care how great they are, how small they are. Everything is important that all hear. Say nothing but what the prophets and Moses say should come. So if we didn't have anything else to help us understand that, we would, uh, well, what could that be? Uh, I, I think, well, they prophesize of Luke records earlier in the Gospels that indeed Moses and the prophets, the Psalms, uh, all the scripture, 
uh, prophesied of the coming of Christ. Well, do we have particulars about Christ? Yes, we do. Look at verse 23. How that by Christ, that Christ must suffer. Not only did he come. Now we're getting into details. Christ must suffer. And how that first by the what? By the what? Resurrection? What did he leave out? Anything left out? No, death is connected with what? Suffering. He suffered. He suffered before he died. He suffered in his death. He died on the cross. And in order to be resurrected, he had to die. So he just says, Christ must suffer, meaning the sufferings of Christ would include his sufferings upon the cross. That's covered. And then how that by the, by the uh, first by the resurrection of the dead should proclaim light both to both the people. Who's the people? When you got the Gentiles connected with the passage, what are the, who are the people? The Jews. Jews, Gentile, people. I, Jesus came to save his people. He's a Jew. And so here's the Jews and the Gentiles. But who's proclaiming the light? In this, in this verse, who's proclaiming the light? How that Christ must suffer and how that he, first by the resurrection of the dead, he, who is he? It's Jesus. Jesus is proclaiming light to the Gentiles. Who's his instrument? Who's the one that's doing the preaching? Jesus come back and preach a little bit? Who's doing the proclamation? Paul's one of them. <laughs> is that what Jesus says to him in verse 17? Delivering thee from the people and the Gentiles unto whom I send thee. Who's talking to him? Jesus is. What I'm sending you to do, I want you to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. They may receive the remission of sins and have an inheritance. And now he equates that with Jesus proclaiming light because they were proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit that only brought the things of Christ. And he uses, he uses one to in order to accomplish that. In fact, all through the book of Acts, Anyone that ever heard the word, heard it by a human. Everyone that heard the gospel in order to be saved, heard it by a human messenger. And these are the apostles, witnesses of his resurrection, who could give eyewitness testimony to the fact of what they were preaching is indeed the truth. And they would give their lives for that truth. I just think it's interesting, don't pass over too quickly, that when Jesus is proclaiming light, he's doing that through his apostles. And that indeed there is that source, uh, the church that receives that. When you persecute the church, Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Oh, no, you, no you're, that's me. My cause, they've submitted to my authority to save. They have, they have received the message that comes from me. No, Peter preached it, Acts 2. Paul's preaching it here in, in a lot of part of the book of Acts to the Gentiles as well. And so he uses Moses and the prophets to say they spoke of the details of Christ's coming in connection with our salvation. And therefore, we, he proclaims, Jesus is proclaiming light. And what happens when we don't proclaim that gospel? When we are not going to be involved in trying to reach our neighbors with the gospel, Jesus ain't speaking to them. Jesus' message is he's not proclaiming anything. And we said, no, we're going to proclaim it. And that's what we're doing. We're going to keep on proclaiming the gospel. Don't care how unpopular it is, how tired we get. We're going to be involved in getting that, that message out there. Because that's, uh, that's the way Jesus is able to proclaim the light to the Gentiles. He's the basis. And we need to always have that message uh, there. And it, and we see the importance of that. We see it in our country. The Constitution is, is under, under stress right now. People doing things that beyond the Constitution just to try it. And what do we have to do? We have to keep coming back, remind us, what is the Constitution? We have to come back as a nation and, and, and do that. Uh, we have one. And it's, it's just not being followed. 
uh, way that uh, it's been where we want to try new ways of doing it and they're just forget about it so it's chaos right now it'll get worked out over over time but it'll be because we do not forget we realize what has been established and this bible has been established and it will never it will never go away but we've got to keep it in front of our our hearts and that's why i'm so appreciative of the fact you're here you're faithful you want we want to study the bible and uh, realize how important that is and just this one point of the book the old testament was pointing toward an event that is so important to our to our eternal salvation it's not uh it's a very simple theme but it's an important theme and how many how many young people today growing up in our society even know the stories of the old testament or even know anything about the old testament i'm talking to people today they don't know the stories of david they don't know the stories of joseph and we're having to uh, teach people the the foundation uh, well we got to teach them that sometimes the old testament to set forth here was here was a prophecy being fulfilled what prophecy and sometimes you have to start at the beginning then all of a sudden it makes a a unified whole that realizes this was God's purpose all along. That's why we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's why we're having vacation Bible school. Who are we teaching this coming week, Lord willing? Who, who are we emphasizing this teaching upon? Or two? Okay, that's good. I'm going to be teaching you every day, and that's true. <laughs> We got classes for you, but we're emphasizing classes for our, our young children. And the, we have a, have a baby class. At least they can hold it, don't tear the book up. This is the Bible, this sort of thing like that. But they learn the stories and they're aware of that to prepare them for the foundation when, when they need to obey the gospel. And so what you're doing in, in exposing your children and to, to the word of God is so important. And the fact that uh, they see you, that's important in your life. That, that is so important because a foundation needs to be there and then it needs to continue in their life that they're not gonna let that light burn out either. And uh, God will always have those people that are not bound their knee to bail and I hope we're part of them. But this message of the Old Testament is so important so a lot of our our stories come from the Old Testament. Of course, we're going to be looking at the New Testament as well. So that'll be, you know, if you don't have anything to do this week and, and you, you have the time, to, you, you bring your, your children. I've, I've gotten calls from one, one lady. She, she wanted to know if we had one, a vacation Bible school. She saw our website, and she wanted to know if we were going to have one, and so we did. But uh, she said, well, my kids are up in uh, Massachusetts, and... Uh, they don't get out till the middle of June out of, out of, out of school. Well, man, I feel sorry for them, don't you? <laughs> we're already out, you know, some of our places. So we're not used to that, but she couldn't bring them, but she wants to look, she'll look at the material and she's a grandmother. And so sometimes uh, we never know who we might reach. Kids from Massachusetts, maybe with grandmother one week and she's gonna bring them. That's what she was planning to do. But that's, I hope we'll never, uh, think well this is not important or uh, it's just busy work no those kids learn early about those stories and they become they they, they become real that's what we're, they're going to build their faith upon and so we need to keep putting Moses the prophets out there understand that they pointed to Jesus Christ why was Festus amazed at Paul's message this may be reading between the lines it may be something because what does he what does he say about uh, about about Paul, that be the key of where we could start, David. Okay. Is it? I think that's exactly it. I think you hit it it's exactly right. Because see, the resurrection is a miracle, and no one ever sees that. Uh, around there, yeah, th he thinks you're great. And you're, you're basing all of your, your preaching on that one event. We think you're crazy, insane, David says. You're, you're, you're mad. So I think that's the context that makes him come up with a loud voice. 
Remember in Athens, that was such strange doctrine, the idea of the resurrection from the dead. They were worshiping their idols. Nope, that's just foreign to us. We, got, we think you might be a little crazy about that. And especially when you're going to hammer that down as, as a reality of truth when you realize that man just can't do that. Only God could accomplish that. So I think that's exactly right. Your learning hath made you mad. All going in this learning, you've now come, into, of course, this particular teaching, and it's based upon your much learning, Paul. Uh, basically, give him credit for that. That, but it's made you crazy or insane, and that was uh, very, very important for him. So, but what did Agrippa perceive in Paul's message? So here's King Agrippa listening to this as well. And let's remember, why is Festus wanting to get him before Agrippa? Because I don't have anything to write about this prisoner. I'm getting ready to send him to Caesar. And I don't have anything to write. He's worthy of death. What's the, what's the problem? So I want you to examine him. So he's wanting Agrippa to take the reins and, and do that. Uh, so Agrippa is in the presence. So what did Agrippa perceive in Paul's message? Which is very interesting to me. It's an underlying the Christian, a Christian. Why don't you say a, a, a studious Jew, <laughs> a learned Jew, or, uh, or even among the Gentiles? He, he said, thou wouldst feign, you know, hear, hear what you're saying, you would uh, perceive, want, want to make me a Christian. And, and notice in verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. He had that foundation, being among the Jews, ruling over them in that region. And Agrippa said to Paul, with but little persuasion, thou wouldest fain make me a Christian. You're trying to make me a Christian. Not that he's agreeable to it and that he wasn't, but he saw the persuasiveness of the teaching. It wasn't just, that's an insane man, so we, we're not going to listen to him. He's listening. And knew what it was about is about being a Christian. Notice how Paul follows up with that in verse 29. Paul said, I would to God, whether with little or with much, what? Persuasion. Not thou only, but all that hear me this day, remember he's speaking to the small and the great, might become such as I am. Who is he? What is he? He's a Christian. Paul is emphasizing that. But it might be nice to not have these bonds. That's the, that's the circumstance Paul finds himself in. So there's a sense of accept these bonds. Why am I being incarcerated here in bonds and, and uh, because I'm preaching the gospel? And uh, the authorities don't want to hear that, especially the Jewish authorities, and they're using the Roman government in order to, to, uh, to shut him up. And to do that. So they're, they're trying to figure out. So Festus thinks you're crazy, Paul. And Agrippa says, you, with, you know, with a little persuasion, y'all will make, make, make me that you think you will. And uh, realize that the evidence is there that points to it. But sometimes we're going to ignore the evidence. And that's, a, that's the, the problem. Any thoughts along that line of those two reactions to the same Paul? The same teaching, the same message being set forth. If he's mad and insane, we know we won't hear him. But the other point, Grippa is sober a little bit about, you, you know, you have, you know, it's pointing toward that. And I know what you're trying to do and uh, to make me one. What does it tell you? <clears throat> because how often do you find the word Christian in the New Testament? A lot of times we find it here once. You only find it three times in the New Testament. And so when you look at those things, you know, we'll, we'll suffer persecution as a Christian. And in, in, in Peter, the, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. What chapter do we see that in? Acts 11. And here we are in Acts 26. We, we find it again. So what can we learn 
about Christianity. Well, you're going to suffer over here. And indeed, you're a disciple or a learner, a follower after Christ. But what is, what is interesting about Christianity here? Danny? Right. They're aware of that's true. And uh, you can build that same foundation today, can't we? Do that. That's true. Do you force anybody to be a Christian? Does that work? You're just persuaded. By what? Evidence? Some think it's foolish. You're crazy. Others think you have a... You, I see what you're building upon. They did... If they point to him, that's an interesting thought to have to contemplate. But thou were as persuadest me to be a Christian. I don't know how anyone can become a Christian that is forced into it. That's, that's part of reality. It's persuasion. It's not argument in the sense I'm arguing into it. I destroyed you, therefore you're a Christian. No, it's persuasion. And persuading one to realize I, I'm ready to receive the gospel. I receive the message because I've been persuaded. And if anyone ever becomes a Christian, that's the route they're going to take. You can't take the microphone down there, make the good confession right now, and you're going to be a Christian. You can't force it. And God doesn't, it's just interesting to me, he put the way of salvation that is indeed, Jesus is the whole focal point of history. <laughs> you know, God brought for the universe that we have time. We, we, we live in time, he doesn't. But all the things brought together uh, was this focus of history, especially when sin entered into the world, man's free will, and God had a plan. If that happens, here's what we're going to do, and we see the plan unfold. And all of that it has uh, there for persuasiveness. What does confirmation of, of one being an apostle, what does that have to do with persuasion? They were eyewitnesses. They're even dying for that cause. It, it, it must be real. They were eyewitnesses of that. They were with him when he died. They fled from him when he was caught before that. And then they become followers of him willing to die the martyr's death. What's all that about? What about the empty tomb? And uh, all the things that you see there, what is that all about? It's to, it, it, well, if he died, his bones should be there. So what was the big, what was the big thing among the Jewish authorities? Tell them that uh, indeed the body was stolen. And that's how they ignore it. Or be a Festus, he's crazy. Ignore it. But, and behind that we said persuasion. And so we have confirmation all the time, miraculous Miracles that they did when they preached the gospel, that was confirmation. That in, indeed, uh, who else could do miracles? Miracles weren't for a sideshow, but it was to confirm that we are preaching the message that comes from God. And in our bulletin this week, I make one, one point. Why, you know, we hear about the snake handlers and uh, so we're, we're going to be talking about Satan and the viper and snakes and stuff this week. And uh, it's just interesting to view the snake handlers that they're more interested in about themselves, that they're truly believers. Because a lot of times they get bitten by copperheads, they won't, go to, they won't get medicine. Because what does Mark 16 say? You will, you will drink poison and you'll be bitten by snakes and you ain't going to die. So I would, it would reflect upon me as a true believer, so a lot of those people die, needlessly. When in reality, the confirmation was the message you're preaching. It ain't about me. But when it becomes that event, it's all about, wow, look at him. And they say, well, he must be teaching the truth. I understand they're putting that together, but th they're not focused upon that because if they, they did that behind the scenes, they'd get some medicine. <laughs> but no, it, they're not a true believer. It's about me being a believer, not about the message I'm presenting. And it's the message. And all the things that we can bring to attention it was, it is there for, to persuade, not force. 
And what happens if they don't want it, we move on. And that should cause us to be free and not discouraged as well. David. thoughts all right what two conclusions did Agrippa reach with Festus concerning Paul's uh, defense what do they both agree on notice in verse 31 let's read, read verse 30 and, and the king rose up and the governor and Bernice or Benice Bernice is what how my Bible trans uh, pronounced it but I said that they uh, sat with with them and so and when they had withdrawn they spake one to another so they got to the side and they're going to be talking this man number one had done nothing worthy of death or a bonds they're both agreed about that but he wants to he, he appeals to Caesar and said and Grippa said to Festus this man might have been set at what might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed to Caesar. We, we might may go, but we can't. And of course that would pacify the Jews too, by the way. We can't because uh, he's requested that, so we got to send him. And, uh, and I don't know really what they have to say now. <laughs> you know, what the chief captain and Fess said, what are we gonna write down on paper about him? But other than the fact that uh, they're, they're gonna send it to him anyway. And uh, Luke's, Luke doesn't tell us about those, those events. But the two conclusions, he's not worthy of death, and if he hadn't requested that, we'd probably set him free. And I wonder about that. Because what would the Jews do? Set him free. They're still trying to kill him, and they would have to deal, deal with that. Any, any thoughts or, uh, on, on that chapter 26? All right. Chapter 27, verse 1. We have the Augustan band, and we're going to be seeing... Uh, these these events with these type of things, especially as Paul goes to as he is involved going to to Rome but you'll you'll notice that as ch chapter 27 opens and when it was determined that he should sail for Italy they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners to a centurion so what's a centurion what's a centipede what's a centurion there were a hundred, a hundred peoples, a hundred men, and they, his name was Julius. He's of the Augustan band. Here's the legions of the Roman army divided up, legion 6,000, but you know, here, here would be divided up to a uh, man over a hundred soldiers. He has authority over him, and he has authority over those hundreds, but he's a trusted, entrusted as a prisoner to Julius. And he's of the Augusta band. We're going to have problems with sailing. And you may never sail your sailboat. And you may, other than the bathtub. But you've got to realize that sometimes the wind's blowing against you. And a lot of times they're going to have to go under the lee. And it'll be interesting as we see, what does that mean? Let the, let the island of Crete, let, let that land barrier be a barrier where we can move and operate with protection from a wind that may be blowing against us. We'll see this twice in this chapter where they had to sail under the lee. And so we see in chapter, verses four and, ver and verse seven. What's well, a yoquillo? It's gonna be a storm that comes up. It's gonna be tearing the boat uh, that, that the passengers are on that we'll be talking about. But this is, this is what we have in our country in the winter time because we're talking about it's past October. We're going into winter when this event happens. But that's like a nor'easter, nor'easter where you know it, I did say northeastern, nor'easter where where we have a we have a big storm that hits our eastern coast uh, around New York and in, in north. It's a big it, it's a big wind event, and uh, they would have that out in the Mediterranean, and that's what took place. 
The searches will be very important because when they land that ship, it'll ground it into the sand. And, and, and people who had their ships, they were, realized that here on the, the borders of the African coast and all of that, that that was a dangerous place. And uh, what would happen if you get your ship grounded in the sand? It's ready to be whipped by the way the winds go and just tear up the ships. So these are real events. And what is interesting to me, this whole chapter deals with reality of the sea and transportation. They'll go over 480 miles in two weeks. It's amazing. And a lot of it was against the wind. And, and during that part of that two weeks, was the, the, for two weeks, they'll be uh, without food and the storm and that sort of thing. But more than a little bit more than two weeks, they would reach their destination that we're going to talk about. But this is not made up story. You read, uh, you read stories of, I remember years ago reading the uh, Book of Mormon and seeing how their stories were like they were in ships like bowls with a stopper on the bottom, that type of thing. And uh, you, you know, that, that, how come that, that wouldn't sink? Because they talk about the, it was kind of about being miraculously saved. But these are real events of the time frame in which we're speaking about that there would, there would indeed be three ships involved before Paul gets to Rome. And they're all going to a certain place at a certain time. It's travel. But it's not, we're going to take the streetcar, we're going to get in a, a taxi cab, or we're going to be flying into that terminal, and we'll be there in a few hours or a few minutes. But we have transportation issues. Where's is that, where that flight going to? Well, this one, the first one is it, it's going to, to Italy and uh, Asia. It, it'll be hovering around the coast, and they'll have to be protected by the wind. They have a south wind to begin with. Everything's good. But it gets it gets real bad. So here's we'll see this in our, our text. But I want us to realize that we're dealing with the Roman government. We're dealing with sailing techniques. We're dealing with real storms. They got a name. Thank you. And we have an, uh, the sand bars there that uh, indeed would shipwreck a lot of a lot of ships that become very, very important. All right. Here's the. Here's the route we're going to be taking. <clears throat> we're going to, we're going to, we're siding, where, where, where are we? We're in Caesarea, aren't we? When he's seeing Agrippa in Caesarea. And they'll be traveling uh, up to, you know, to Sidon. And we're going to find that something happens there and everything's fine. Centurion lets him uh, be with his friends. And we're going to, Mira will be a, an important place where they're hovering around that coast. They'll go under the lee of Crete, under the lee, protection from the wind, and so forth. Because they were really wanting to, you know, take a more northern course. But they found themselves shipwrecked over here in, in Malta. And uh, all the events that, that happened there. And so you have the coast of African, you know, Egypt. You got where the sandbars are there. Sailors knew they didn't want to be there. And so those events are going to be taking place as they're going to end up, though, in Rome, Italy, uh, when we get through with our, our study of, of Acts. So let's begin by looking at some of the details. What time of year was Paul's voyage made? And there's little key points that you, you figure out what, uh, what it was, and we'll, we'll come back to it as well when we talk about a fast. We know the fast had already passed. What fast that would help us understand the time of year? It's already gone past this. Do you, was there something very, uh, a fast that was connected with any of the major feasts among the Jews? Feast of Tabernacles, that was harvest, that was joyous, that was uh, uh, the Passover. Uh, fasting? No, we're eating. What was the other one? Day of Atonement, where you would afflict your soul. Afflict your soul. When the Bible, when the New Testament speaks about that, that in, indeed is, is when you're, you're going without food. And that was connected with the, 
the Day of Atonement. And that helps us understand the, the time frame that we're, we're looking at, that when that, that took place. And Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, we could look at those passages and, and see that, but you can look at that for, your, for yourself, Luke 23, 20, 27. But this was the time of year when they're planning the voyage with the, the fast that already passed, and that was in October. So we're approaching winter is when these things are, are, are occurring, and that becomes very important. So, wintertime, close to it. What did the centurion allow Paul to do after one day of sailing? Let's notice in verse 2, embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was about to sail under the places on the coast of Asia, that means Asia Minor, near the coastline there, and he probably had to get on another ship, get to Italy, you know, like we'd change planes. But he says, what happened? He has Aristarchus. He was a Macedonian of Thessalonica. He was with us. With us means Luke is on ship, huh? Luke is making this journey with him. Us. And the next day we touched at Sidon. There we went from Caesarea, remember Sidon? Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly. Who is Julius? He's a centurion. You'll never read anything negative about any centurion in the New Testament. Not one. They're noble. And they're noble as far as the gospel is concerned. And it's just amazing to me. They're honorable soldiers. Honorable men. And kindness was there with a prisoner. Imagine that. Treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go unto his friends and refresh himself. He just kind of went up the coastline a little bit, got to, got to Sidon. And, but putting to sea from this, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Under the lee, winds are contrary. Have a little blockage where we could tack better. And we, when we had sailed across the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, you remember that on the, on the map, and it said, a city of Lycia, and there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us therein. And when we sailed, so many days were come with difficulty over against Snodus, and we'll have to stop there, and we'll, we'll pick, pick it up. But we're going to see the argument between the ship owner and the, the captain, so to speak, the one that's running the ship, and Paul, and we'll talk about that uh, uh, Lord willing, next time.